which is so important, um, but so frightening for so many of us, is that um, there's nothing we can do to 100% mitigate every risk that happens. So what we need to do is focus on doing that which is possible, that which is attainable, as quickly and as well as we can to make sure we're making sure that all of our schools are safe and making sure that we have a safe community all around. Um, so um, we're gonna we're gonna try. We've got a lot of questions were submitted in advance of this. Our MC uh, our, our, for the evening, uh, Christina Cotlas, has sort of tried to distill those questions down to a series of questions that capture the main themes that we've heard a lot of in a, a lot about this evening. Um, so hopefully you'll get some of the feedback that you were looking to get this evening. Um, but with that, I know you're not here to listen to me just make a speech. So with that, I'm going to introduce our uh, master of ceremonies for this evening. Uh, Christina Collis is the, uh, you can clap. She's great. She's great. <laughs> Christina is the editor, publisher? Sure. Sure. She's the lady in charge of pwcmoms.com, uh, which is a website that's a great website, a great resource for parents here in Prince William County about things to do with your kids and important things going on in our schools. She's going to moderate the evening, and I'm going to allow her to introduce all of our panelists. Thank you so much. Good evening. So as Supervisor Noe mentioned, um, I also received a lot of emails from my followers and have tried to distill them down, take out the personal stories behind them so that we can answer as many as possible. And I'd like to introduce you briefly to our panel. Um, down on the end, hopefully I'm going in order, and on your sheet you have a little bit of a bio for everyone who's here. Um, we have Scott Miller. We have Dr. Lindsay Ledke. We have... Um, <laughs> I'm trying to go in the order that's on here and it's, it's not working out for me. Um, but we have Stacey Phillips. We have Mr. Crow. We have Supervisor Noe. We have Chief Bernard. We have uh, Diane Ralston. We have Sheriff Hill. And we have um, Mr. Deutsch from the school board as well. So those will be our panelists for this evening. I think what we'd like to start with, um, especially in light of the fact that we had a recent threat at Forest Park High School, um, is a question that I got frequently. Who specifically is responsible for ensuring that my children are safe from threats? What is the procedure for analyzing the validity of such threats? And um, what type of protocol is Prince William County Schools using? Additionally, parents asked what is done to evaluate a student if they make a threat to allow them back into school. And I'd like to direct that to Mr. Klein, uh, Mr. Crow, Sheriff Hill, and Chief Bernard to start with. And then if anyone else would like to throw in, that'd be great. Okay, a lot of parts of that question. So we'll see what uh, we can start with here. As far as who's responsible for ensuring the safety of your students from threats. Well, you know, I don't want to sound cliche, but look around. There's no one in this room that doesn't have some responsibility for the safety and security of your children. Um, my office with the Department of Risk Management and Security, we manage policy, we manage uh, training of school staff. Um, you know, the police department is here, obviously. Uh, they uh, provide the presence in school, do investigation. Our, our uh, parents that are in the room, I mean, one of our biggest issues now is social media. So if you can help us monitoring, you know, what's going on in social media, um, that's a help. And of course, our teachers and our uh, uh, principals in the school. So there's no one here. Uh, that doesn't have a part in managing uh, school safety and security. Good evening. Great to be here. Appreciate everybody coming out tonight. Uh, as uh, Ron suggested, we all are responsible. We all have a role to keep our schools safe, a safe and secure environment for everyone, for all the stakeholders. Of course, our students, our staff, our community, our visitors to the schools, everyone in this room, and many, of course, who aren't with us tonight, all have a role. It takes a comprehensive approach. And oftentimes, we look to law enforcement for certain responses and services, which, which is certainly appropriate, but it really takes a comprehensive approach uh, from the human services, the social services, the counselors. Uh, everyone has a role to play uh, in this question, in this issue about keeping our schools safe. It's it's a multi-layered approach. Uh, for the police department, 
A threat is a threat until it's not. Full stop. That's kind of how we assess these things. So whatever it is, we need people to report to us. Uh, we want intelligence plus investigation equals our best opportunity to deter violence. Intelligence plus investigation equal, has our best opportunity to deter violence. So we need people to talk to us uh, and, and tell us things. And, and my uh, counsel to anybody is don't evaluate the information. That's our job. Oh, gee, is this important enough to report? Should I, should I report this? It seems kind of small. Well, the answer is yes in all cases. You should report it and then let us evaluate it and act on it as we deem appropriate. So we look forward to uh, more conversations tonight. But uh, every threat, uh, I think there was a part of the question about protocol, every threat is important to us and we vigorously investigate uh, these threats. Since Parkland, we've had 47 incidents or threats in Prince William County, which in some levels to me is not surprising. Uh, you know, we had quite a few after Columbine. Uh, so uh, that's where we are today. And we've looked in every one of those. Thank you. Good evening. And thank you everyone for being here. Uh, of course, I'm Glenn Hill. I'm your sheriff. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, my officers, my deputies do is train with the police department. Uh, it's not the sheriff's office's primary responsibility, but we train with the, our police department and they do an excellent job putting together uh, our training programs. Um, as your sheriff also, uh, occasionally I serve on the legislative committee for the Virginia Sheriff's Association. And of course, if there are any existing laws or legislation, that you would like to ask me about and my position on as your sheriff, I will be glad to uh, answer that question for you tonight. I see Delegate Anderson, former Delegate Anderson here, and uh, of course when he was in office, uh, we see certain legislation that comes up as far as safety, about schools or even for our community. Uh, I'm on the phone calling him four or five times, telling him the position of the sheriff. And of course we, we lobby our delegates to make sure they put the best laws and plates that will better serve our community. So again, thank you for being here. Thank you. That was a lot of parts to that question, so let me circle back to one, which is if a student makes a threat, is there a protocol for allowing them back into school? I'll talk a little bit about that just because we do have a threat assessment process that's required by the Code of Virginia. They probably can talk about it a little bit more specifically, but anytime any child makes a threat in school, um, every single one of those uh, children receive a threat assessment in school by a threat assessment team. Uh, Prince William's the only county in Virginia that has a dedicated threat assessment coordinator. Uh, as a matter of fact, she goes around and uh, teaches for DCJS around the state. Uh, so other, uh, other municipalities can put in the uh, same uh, processes that we have in place here. Um, depending on whether those assessments are low, medium, or high, there are certain actions that take place um, on the mental health uh, spectrum prior to them returning to school. I haven't actually prepared for this question. <laughs> um, so I'm just gonna kind of throw out some information there. I know that um, in the past, I don't currently work for Prince William County Community Services, um, but the Emergency Services Department, um, they do a fair amount of threat assessment, um, suicidal assessments, as well as homicidal assessments, and would make appropriate recommendations. Um, in private practice at Psychological and Life Skills Associates, we don't see as much homicidal threat as we do suicidal threats where we um, make sure that the student isn't a harm to themselves before we say, okay, this is the recommendation and they, they're okay to go back to school, but we need to keep seeing them. Um, in a lot of these cases, it's, it's just important that you get your kids to a mental health professional as, as soon as possible and, and let us do our job um, in making sure that they're getting the, the most help that they can. Um, and making the determination about what's going to happen. Do you have anything to add to that? 
My name is Scott Miller. Good evening. I'm a child and family therapist with Dr. Ludke at uh, Psychological and Life Skills Associates. Um, I'm new to Virginia. My, most of my practice is in North Carolina. But in the same scenario, we've done, I've done um, threat assessments for kids that present with suicidal ideations or homicidal ideations. And I've gotten those threat assessments. And so my job is, as a licensed clinician, to assess that individual in the context, assess the family situation, and make recommendations. Um, and we go from there, but I think that the main piece there is to, to follow that protocol and get them to a, a licensed mental health professional. So you can't make general, broad recommendations, it has to be appropriate to that individual. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add to that is that obviously after hours, you might not be able to get into a mental health um, counselor, and so most will at that point take your child to Fairfax Children's um, in the emergency room and have a psych assessment done at that time. Um, that's about it. Mrs. Rossman? Hi. Good evening. The school board's main objective in this particular conversation is to make sure that we bring forth to Richmond our best possible issues so that they can be acted upon. This year, uh, the only word I had was mental health. We knocked on all the doors of our electeds in Richmond, and I kept talking about mental health. So if we write a good piece and we pass it on to our electeds in, um, in Richmond, then hopefully money and assets come back to us. So when you hear from us next year, you'll know why. Thanks. Okay, let's circle back to what parents can do right now. And if I could um, send this question down to the far end of the table um, to start with. In the wake of threats, how can parents empower their children to feel safe about going to school? And what kind of resources are available for children who feel scared about going to school, especially following an incident? Okay, so I'm, I'm hearing that question. Um, when I hear how can parents empower their children to feel in control of their safety, there's limits to what we can control. And so I think the first component is to engage our children in dialogue and understand what are they worried about. Maybe part of this and then come, them come to panels or come to this panel as a family to initiate dialogue. Um, there's things that our kids can control, things that they can't, and I think we have to understand those limits. Um, But I think the takeaway to empower our kids is to engage in dialogue and see what they're thinking, what they're worried about, what we as parents can control and affect. Um, and what we can't, we engage with, we come to these kind of panels and learn about school security and learn about what's going on in the mental health realm. So, yeah. um, so when you think about empowering somebody, think about how you would want to be empowered. And a lot of time when we think about that, we think about, I want to be validated. Um, when I say something or I feel something, I want somebody to say, yeah, that really sucks, or that really hurts, or I understand that, or they, they, want, they don't want you to come back and be like, oh, you're being silly, oh, you're being ridiculous, oh, that's a stupid idea. Um, that's not how you're gonna empower your kids. Um, so asking them about um, what it is that they feel is gonna keep them safe. Um, even if it sounds ridiculous to our adult ears, they may actually have a pretty good solution um, that we as adults can try to help support um, and find the funding or do something um, that can make them feel more secure or safe um, in school. Um, that's the best that we can do in those types of situations and empower. So think about how would I want to be empowered and then try to apply that to your kids. Um, they're going to be adults someday. So. Yep, that hit it. All right, while we're talking about making children feel empowered, let's talk a little bit about the drilling that we do for our students. Um, we had some parents ask why parents are not informed about lockdown drills so that they can prepare their children emotionally or at least told afterwards so they can debrief them after the fact. Um, and what should they tell children about these drills if they're preparing them for them emotionally? Um, so if we have anyone from the school system that would like to talk about why we don't maybe let parents know ahead of time. 
Okay, so right now by Code, uh, Code of Virginia, we've got about 19 crisis drills that each school has to do each year. Um, so there's numbers of them that are going on. Uh, to be completely honest with you, I probably haven't heard this question in, since the first three or four years back in the early 2000s when we started doing this. Um, your generation is the first generation of the kids that have grown up with uh, you know, active shooter and, and all of the drills that we have in place. Um, starting since the first grade. So um, I think, you know, in a lot of, for most of the children, they're used to it. It's just part of their educational process, just like fire alarm drills and everything else at this point. I'm sure there are kids that are more sensitive to some of the things that are going on um, and, and may look to their school counselor or someone else for some type of guidance on that. Okay, and as a follow-up, do these drills help children? Well, I'll tell you this. Um, it just from the perspective of what I of what we're trying to accomplish, um, when you have a crisis, you fall back and you're under stress and you're based upon the things you learn in practice. It's imperative that we learn and practice those things um, as much as we do because you know we do various drills. We go in and we critique drills at schools. Um, we do unannounced drills, and with just that little bit of uncertainty, people forget easy steps. So we try to make our uh, crisis plans and what we ask people to do as simple as possible because we understand under stress it's hard to even remember those things. So this is um, this speaks directly to the fight or flight response and when that adrenaline system really gets pumping it is so hard for us to make a decision about where to go. It's kind of like being a squirrel underneath a the car. They start darting everywhere. They don't know where to go. But if you've already made a plan for what it is that you're going to do in a crisis situation I don't know what the statistics are, but I, I, from my training, I know that you're more likely to follow through with that plan. Um, you don't even have to think. It's already in place. Your feet are already moving in the direction you need to be going in. Um, so just like fire drills, they're important things to do. The context of a lockdown drill is a little bit different, um, but it's still that I think that that is the best way to explain to your children that this is why we do them, is because if you know what to do, you're gonna to get to a safe location a lot faster than just running around in circles or putting yourself in harm's way or other people in harm's way. Um, so it's, I don't think it's something that would scare them. I think it's, it's an important thing to do. Does that cover it? And I, I think also something that we were talking about earlier is that, and, and it's, it's a little bit of a different situation, but when you look at um, states in the Midwest um, the, the, the lockdown drills that they do when there's going to be tornado warnings and things like that are actually much more um, conducive to possibly causing trauma and things like that. But as you said, um, the fact is, is that we, we simply don't know, we don't have an understanding of what best practice is on this actual topic because there hasn't been research done on it um, in terms of lockdown drills for active, active shooters. So. I think that what's best is the familiarity is, is what is learned, and then it becomes more normalized. Okay, switching gears a little bit, um, I know that I got a lot of questions about specific pieces of equipment that parents felt like schools needed, and rather than ask about each of those individually, um, we're going to lump them together and ask if there's a standard as far as what schools are going to be required to have for safety enhancements or if that's being left to being part of site-based management for each school. It's on. Oh, all right, thank you. So we actually just had a infrastructure task force committee that's been reviewing a lot of the physical security components that are involved in our schools and they work through the elementary side of things. And the school board got a fairly extensive breakdown of what it would take at different schools to bring each school up to the same level. Uh, and I think whether we do that in the upcoming budget or we do it in the end of the year spending and start working on it right away, uh, there's going to be the action taken to bring all of the elementary schools up to the same standard of physical security. Uh, the numbers are currently being worked for middle school and high school uh, in light of the recent tragedy in Florida to escalate that process and hopefully we can move very quickly on those as well. So that's definitely a priority, and I think that uh, at the end of the day, what, what the buildings look like, uh, what our infrastructure situation is, is a board situation, 
and one that we're going to work to standardize. And already we're being proactive about doing well before this happened. Do we have um, any kind of dates on any of those levels and when we're going to have them standardized? Uh, if we approve the year-end funding, we can start knocking out the punch list as soon as the money's approved. Uh, otherwise, if it's in the budget, we can start as soon as July 1 happens. Uh, and then it's a matter of moving as quickly as possible, but um, it's, just, it's funding a uh, question just how soon the funding gets approved. Okay. Anyone else like to? Yeah, just let me follow up on that a little bit. Um, this isn't something new we've been looking at. Uh, back in 2008, we met with our construction department. We started implementing numbers of standardized things uh, for security in all of our schools. So uh, post-2008, most of those schools have all of those things in place already. However, how many schools? We probably had 75 schools in 2008. So it's been a process since then getting all the other schools up to date. We do have a, a process in place. Um, you're talking millions of dollars and numbers of years to get that done. So with 100 facilities, uh, now that we have, we're continuing uh, to work. It's a process, but uh, the school board has, um, you know, is putting monies aside to uh, accelerate those uh, those processes and initiatives and, and get get them uh, complete more quickly. Thank you. All right. Um, our next question came a few times, um, which was. Has Prince William County Schools had their lockdown procedures analyzed for effectiveness? If so, is that information available to the public? Um, if not, why not? I can make a pretty good guess about that, but if anyone would like to give us the official answer, um, let's throw that to our law enforcement and to our um, school officials. So as far as lockdown procedures, I mean, we go about doing our job the same way as you do mostly in your everyday life. We, we assess, uh, assess what's going on in schools. That's called vulnerability assessments. Um, we look at best practices. We go to professional development. We talk to our colleagues. And we implement those processes and procedures. Um, so you're going to find out what we're doing in, in, in most major school divisions are going to look fairly similar. Um, the state of Virginia right now requires us to do assessments every three years, but you know, we're assessing our schools on a regular basis, on a daily basis, uh, as far as needs, as far as training. Um, I can tell you back in 2012, we had a large government grant. We had an outside vendor come in to give us some new eyes on our programs, um, and that was very successful. Um, they were, uh, as far as a lot of the things they found in Prince William County, um, they were taking those things out and using them for best practices in other locations where they have, um, uh, were doing assessments. Uh, the crisis management plan we had, they said it was one of the best they've ever seen, and they are using that in other locations also. So we do look at um, our, our procedures we take. We assess them every year. Every summer, we look at every school crisis management plan to make sure they're updated, uh, check their uh, crisis logs to make sure they're all completed, and uh, we go out and we assess um, numbers of schools every year on their, their drills. All right. The next question was, what is the plan for having more school psychologists and counselors, both to be available to students who need them and to act as resources for parents? And I will open that up to anyone. I think this is a topic that's definitely uh, been very important. Uh, the social workers, counselors are, in a lot of respects, our first line of defense uh, in terms of having direct interaction with students. Uh, we've made a push over the last two years in the budget to escalate the number of uh, uh, counselors and psychologists that are being hired. I think you're going to hopefully see a push for additional social workers uh, to help bring the ratios on those down. And so we've got markup on Wednesday. I think you're going to see a lot of interest in uh, counselors, psychologists, and social workers coming up. I think another important change that's taking place is that, um, and, and it's been touched on a little bit, is a higher level of coordination, sort of all of these pieces. I mean, we talk, the question goes specifically to the, to the mental health piece, the need for psychologists or counselors, um, but it, the same applies really on the um, sort of more classic public safety side. Um, and that is a higher level of coordination across all of the agencies that need to be involved in this. I think it seems like one of the challenges we're dealing with as a country is there's a lot of talk when we, when we look at 
these sort of tragedies that, we, that we're all afraid of is, um, do we need more public safety, and if so, what does that mean? Or do we need to put more resources into mental health, and if so, what does that mean? And the answer is we need to do both. Um, but I know, I see our county executive is sitting in the back row, he's, he's probably, he's a little nervous about what I'm gonna commit him to here. Um, but, um, but I know that uh, one of the things that we talked about at the Board of Supervisors meeting very recently is increasing the coordination between our county-wide mental health services agencies, our Community Services Board, our Department of Social Services, for example, um, our health department, um, with their counterparts in the school system. Um, I think traditionally we've had a, a challenge, and this is true in, I think, in almost probably every jurisdiction in the country, is that we build silos. There's the schools, and then there's the rest of the government. And um, I was talking to someone just a day or two ago about how um, there's an evolution, a really necessary evolution happening where rather than thinking about the schools taking care of children, at, or ch taking care of children during the school day, and the other parts of the government taking care of the adults and the children on the weekends and in the evenings. We need to move away from that. And um, so having that better coordination where not, yes, yeah, certainly having counselors, having well-trained psychological, uh, psychologically trained people in, that are physically located in the schools, but also being able to bring to bear resources from our mental health agencies and our social services agencies and get those into the schools to support the school staff and make sure that every child has access to the services that they might need. Well, and that's great for our follow-up question on that, which is if my child feels threatened, feels bullied, is depressed, but we can't afford private counseling, what options are available in the county for help? There's, um, there are some therapists in the area that will do sliding scale fees for people that don't have insurance. Um, and then there's other options for therapy as far as like group therapy that you can do. You can do workshops, you can do community events like this to bring awareness to a situation. Um, there's places like ARC and NAMI, which provide a lot of really great community resources um, to people. Um, again, it's not the one-on-one -on -one attention that you might get um, or that you might need, um, especially in a threat assessment situation, but there's a lot of information out there um, self-help books, webinars, all kinds of information that could be quite helpful um, for your kid and yourself. Yeah, and with the Department of Justice Office for Victims of Crime, we fund um, many different community-based um, advocates, uh, counselors, therapists, and there's information out there um, where if you dial that number and you give them your circumstances, they do have therapists that are pro bono, uh, that's a legal term, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, um, that are funded through us um, for instances like that. If it happens at school, we have someone there in every school that can be of assistance to your kids. So that's, that's just to try to make you feel comfortable enough to know that we're not leaving them behind or we're not paying attention. The schools pay perfect, pay really good attention to kids. This is their place. And this is what our teaching staff and our administrative staff is supposed to do, to look out for them, to make sure everything is okay. And I was thinking about, I was watching uh, fire drills. And the fire drills are real interesting. You need to go watch them. Those kids know exactly how to walk out of a school in a straight line and not talking or bothering anybody else. They are quite smart because they are used to doing it. So no matter what it is, they'll be able to fill in. And then I was thinking, I come from California, we have earthquakes, we can never prepare. But when they feel the first shake there, they get under a desk. So it tells you that kids are very, very agile. Uh, they're, they're flexible in whatever you ask them to do, and they are doing it well. Okay. Um, Chief Bernard and Sheriff Hill, this next question is for you. Um, I had several parents ask me what type of training or procedures are in place for our police force in handling special needs students. Um, for example, do they know which classrooms house autistic children who may not be able to follow directions such as put your hands up? Uh, 
great question, great response will be this train this summer we do another round of training and we're going to include that. Having said that, so that's the answer. We haven't looked at it in the past, but we're going to in the future, starting this, starting, uh, we train this summer. Having said that, we have uh, about 130, 140 officers who have crisis intervention training, uh, who have some, uh, uh, some of that training involves uh, people with special needs. Uh, we are also, uh, a complement of officers entering a classroom under these very challenging circumstances. Um, noise, concern, anxiety, fear, panic uh, in a situation such as this. Uh, we're not going to be surprised if kids, children, adults don't do what we ask them to do the first or second or even third time. We're not going to be surprised if you know, we say, let's do this, and some do and some don't, you know, respond immediately. That's not going to surprise us. Uh, we face that every evening, and as we do police work in Prince William County, people don't always do what we ask them to do the first time. So that's not going to surprise us, but I, I appreciate the point. I think it's a point well taken, and uh, we're going to address that. Okay. Um. I think one of the most heartbreaking questions that I got was, um, how do I know if my child could potentially be a threat to others and what should I be looking for? So I'd like to send that down maybe to Mr. Miller and Dr. Leduc and Ms. Phillips. I think that's an excellent question. It's a sensitive question. I think the first thing is if, if you're having those thoughts or worries, you gotta connect your kid to a counselor. Um, you, you don't want to, if, if you're having those thoughts, then you need to be speaking to a professional. Um, if you don't have those resources and, and the school's having that conversation with you, you know, they're going to do that threat assessment. They're going to um, give you some resources. But Google's a great tool, you know, licensed clinicians in my area. Um, and speaking, that's, it's, that's not, you don't want to be trying to make that call or like decide if, is this important enough? Is this dangerous enough? Let the professional do their job. Let me do my job. Um, but if you have concerns, connect them to a licensed therapist. Um, I think the biggest prevention you can do is know your kids. Um, talk to your kids. Check in with your kids. Know where your kids are hanging out at. If your kids stay in the night, know that kid. Know their parents. Talk to the parents that you're, you know, the parents of the kids that your kids are spending time with. And that there might be some cultural changes we're connecting to a phone and not engaging enough, but that's probably the biggest preventative thing that we can do is interact, engage, open up dialogue. But if you're even having those thoughts or concerns, get your kid to a therapist. That's, yeah. So like Mr. Miller was saying is that it's, um, that dialogue and knowing your kids is a critical component. So, but with that, there are some red flags that you are definitely gonna want to bring your kid in and have them properly assessed. Now, when I give you these red flags, I don't want you to start jumping to really bad conclusions. These red flags basically mean that anything could be happening. It could be something as simple as just a general anxiety to something a bit more severe. Um, and that's where we step in and we make that determination on what exactly those red flags mean. So basically what you're looking for are sig a significant lack of empathy. If your kid is pulling legs off of um, insects or it seems to enjoy hurting animals, these are really bad signs um, and we need to be seeing that child um, or that teenager, adult for that matter. Um, any kind of violent fantasies, obsessions with death, with um, I almost hate to say this, but obsessions with guns can, um, may not be such a good thing. It depends on all of the other variables that could be going on. Um, so that I don't just throw that out there as a, a small little thing. Um, if they're doing a lot of research about past shootings um, and, they, and they show a particular interest in those types of things, if they're isolating, um, like Mr. Miller was saying, they're way too engaged in their phone. Um, you can't get them away. They're throwing temper tantrums. Um, it could also be anything from um, just massive, uh, drastic changes in their behavior. 
Um, one minute they're engaged with you, um, they're having dinners with you, and then the next minute they're gone. Um, and they're, they, they want nothing to do with you, they're not talking to you anymore. That's a time to get us to come in and see if we can't build a connection with them and find out what's going on. Um, let me just check my note here, make sure I'm not missing something that's super important. Did you have something else? You said we're asking what signs should you look for, and I think maybe one of those blatant signs is if there are threats. If your child is making uh, threats aloud to hurt other people, um, if they're by their social media, I would. There's been some different versions of questions, but one of the questions. It, let me back up. If you're hearing threats from a child, treat them all seriously. Report those threats. Let let law enforcement do the job. If your kid's telling you he's going to kill someone, you know. Let them talk to a mental health professional. Um, and don't try to tease out or decide whether it's serious or not on your own. Like, engage the people that are trained and, and experienced to handle these kinds of situations. Yeah, and I think to piggyback off what Lindsay was saying is, um, you know, any type of callous uh, behavior, uh, lack of remorse, um, not just lack of empathy, but lack of remorse, um, but I also think it's important to, to remember that it's a very small minority of people or children with mental health issues that ever become violent. So, um, you know, kids that isolate themselves, I'm sure that you've seen um, a lot of things on social media right now um, when they're talking about the walkouts. Some letters have been written by teachers that talk about, you know, the child in the corner. Um, that sits by himself, bring him in, talk to him. You know, kids that isolate themselves um, and can't express themselves, it's just something to be aware of. Um, and I think it's also important to remember, especially in times of adolescence, it's a very tumultuous time for them. The adolescent brain is, it's kind of crazy. <laughs> so don't run and think the worst, like Lindsay said, every time, but you need to be aware of what's going on and don't wait either if it's something that's repetitive, that you're watching patterns of their behavior. Okay, so let's transition from that. I think that um, it's been made clear several times that the thing to do is to take any type of a threat to be evaluated seriously. Um, one of the questions was, if I'm concerned about comments, social media, et cetera, from a child, who should I go to for help? Um, especially since I don't want to get a child arrested for something that was just an angry comment, but I don't want to not take it seriously either. So who should people be approaching for help if they see some kind of a threat? And maybe we could talk a little bit about how children are handled if they've made a threat um, so that people will know they're not just getting hauled off um, to jail. Um, again, from my past experience with um, community emergency services, um, what would happen is a threat would come in. They might be picked up by the police um, who decide that um, a mental health evaluation needs to occur. Um, and so they will take them to the hospital, they'd call one of us in, and we would make the assessment. Um, I don't know, that's more of a legal question as far as where that line is of when they get arrested. Um, but if from the mental health aspect of it, if a threat is made, um, that's what I've seen from my experience. Uh, you should tell someone, in an, a, a child or a teenager should report information they're concerned about or a parent to someone who can help get it to the police department so that we can look at it. You can tell a trusted friend, some, an adult here in the school, someone, our school resource officers, which are in our middle schools and high schools, uh, but we need to get that information. I think the schools have a tip line, which they check multiple times a day, I believe, Ron. Yes. Um, and if all else, you know, if you're not sure, if there's some uncertainty, uh, you're not confident in that the information is, you know, tracked to us. You can call 911. We'll, we'll have someone call you back or, or come to you. Uh, we do receive text messages at our communication center. You can text us if you want to. However you want to do it. Uh, but I can't emphasize enough how important it is for information about threats to get to us. 
I can't emphasize that enough. Just someone you trust, some adult authority figure for, for kids and teenagers that you trust, uh, school figures, school authority figures, teachers, staff, they will get that to uh, their principals or others, you know, in leadership roles in the schools, and those folks will contact us in risk management, and we will look into it quickly. Chrissy, I'm going I'm to build on the question a little bit, maybe go back to the chief. I know that um, I, I've talked to people about this all the time. People know there's a problem, they fear there's a problem in the, in the community. It could be with their child in a situation like we're talking about tonight, but it could be with something else. I think the fear is, well, I don't want to raise an alarm bell and get someone into legal trouble who, it, where it's inappropriate. I mean, is that something that people, is that, is that a legitimate fear people should have? No, is the answer. Uh, we've, just as an example, we have, uh, I looked at 47 of these, as I mentioned earlier, since Parkland, we've charged a handful of people. A handful of people have been charged. Um, most of those incidents were not credible. Most of those incidents, there were, were no charges placed. There might have been some school action taken on some of them, you know, without charges being placed. We also have a process where we can bring children and in Virginia, a child is someone under 18. We probably all know that, but just, uh, we can bring them into an informal setting in the judicial system where we can help lead them to counseling and services for them and their families. So we're not you know, rushing to charge people just to charge people. Uh, we're in the risk management business in some sense, and that includes counseling, Police people, law enforcement people, we understand the value of counselors and of mental health and of social services and human services. We get that. We support that 100%. Uh, so we are not just going to, uh, you know, well, we do have a charge here, we could charge. Probably be a lot of places we could charge, but we choose to go another path, the right path. So out of these 40 so I mentioned, we've only charged a handful. And I think that was, uh, I'm familiar with those cases and I think that was appropriate. Uh, so no, uh, I would continue my same speech. Uh, report to us, let us evaluate it, let us do what we do. Do not evaluate the information, Jesus is important enough. Please call us. We have had two events in Prince William County. So, uh, 2004, uh, we had an event at Bora Middle School, probably a lot of people here are familiar with that. Uh, and in 2009, we had an event at Northern Virginia Community College in Woodbridge. Thank goodness, in both of these incidents, no one was physically hurt, physically hurt. So it has happened in Prince William County, it can happen in Prince William County. Um, so we want to do everything we can to prevent something from happening. And there's lots of pieces to that. The mental health folks talking with kids, parents talking with kids, being engaged with your children, having those conversations age appropriate for whatever age your kids are, your, teen your teenagers are, uh, you know, giving them a hug, building that confidence in them to come to you, watching out for things as was mentioned by our mental health professionals here and then taking some appropriate action to help. We want to do everything we can to stop an event and prevent an event on the front end. Uh, that's what we all, I'm sure, want to do. Um, and we do that by seeking out professionals, being strong parents, being engaged with our kids on all levels, paying attention to what they're doing. That's it's just so important. So. But it's, it really takes everyone to do this. We all have our role. So the answer, Mr. Noe, after all that is no. <laughs> uh, but, so, but do call us and let us work through it. it if, uh, I, I encourage you to do that. Thank you. I just want to jump in and kind of make a comment about how, how difficult it is to deal with a lack of control. Um, and whenever you do have to report information to an authority, it can be really scary. Um, what are they going to do with that information? Maybe there's something I can do. Maybe I can save this kid. Um, 
you know, and it's it's really hard to be like, you know what, I, I'm out of my league here and I need to let somebody else step in. Um, that can be very scary for ourselves to let go of that. Um, even as a mental health professional, um, the state of Virginia does not let me make decisions about what is child abuse. I have to report that to a professional because that's not my lane. Um, so I just wanted to point that out about how difficult that can be um, and just to encourage you to um, follow through with trusting um, these authority figures. Um, we do know what we are doing, and it, it, but it can be very hard, even for myself. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, switching gears again. Um, I'm going to direct this next question to those from the school board and from the school system itself. Um, and I'm sure it is not the first time that you've had a question about mobile education units. Um, I got some colorful euphemisms for trailers. Um, <laughs> I should have brought a list, but I didn't. Um, the question basically boiled down to, is there a special plan in place for students who are in trailers um, should there be any kind of an active shooter situation, especially given that um, it's an outdoor, a little bit less secure, at least in the, in the way that parents view them? Um, they really don't like the trailers, guys, just in case you didn't know. Uh, yeah, trailer's a trailer. I mean, you can call it a learning cottage or whatever you want to call it, but you know, it comes down to as a trailer with four metal walls and, and a couple metal doors in the front. Um, however, you know, we do have numbers of them in Prince William County. We've got processes and procedures in place, communication, um, lockdown procedures for them also. All those doors are, are locked at all times. All visitors have to go to the main office. Um, you know, and, and quite frankly, the safest place for you in any, any active shooter situation is behind the locked door, wherever that is. Um, I can tell you, in the past 20 some odd years, the research shows that the one place, there's only been one occasion where a actual locked classroom door has been breached. So when you look at uh, Sandy Hook, where they went in classrooms where the doors were closed but not locked, when you look at Virginia Tech, where uh, the door simply just didn't have locks, um, only one time in 2005 in Red Lake, Minnesota, has there been a documented case of where a locked classroom door was breached. So we preach, get behind a locked door. Okay, close the doors, keep them locked. We require all the teachers to keep their doors closed and locked during the school day. Um, so wherever you're at, that's where we want you to be, behind a closed locked door. All right. Um, another special question that parents asked was if there are procedures in place for students at recess and at arrival and dismissal times, and if those are practiced and drilled as well as regular lockdown procedures. Yes. That was a good answer. That's probably my favorite. No, one. I mean, there's, there's all, there, you know, clearly there's all kinds of difficult situations at schools. Um, there's times of the day where we're clearly more vulnerable than others. Um, arrival and departures, you know, you've got all the kids getting there, coming into the buildings, they're leaving at the end of the day. Um, those are vulnerable situations. Uh, we have, like I said, 19 different drills that we do during the school year for, you know, evacuation, lockdown. Uh, secure the building, so we're doing lots of those drills, we're evaluating those drills, um, but there are vulnerable times uh, that, that occur and you know, we do the best with those when we can. Uh, we've implemented uh, procedures for when kids are in open spaces, uh, we've implemented things for uh, uh, options-based responses for teachers that we call defend options that we train them on, so even if you're in a location and you become uh, threatened in some way, shape, or form, um, we're giving you options uh, to try to, uh, to manage that situation. Uh, but there are also times where you're going to do the best you can with what you're at. We have interior classrooms that don't have outside windows. We have trailers. We have um, lunchtime. We have open hallways during, uh, during class changes. These are all vulnerable times. Um, and we do talk to students about what they should do. And sometimes you've heard run, hide, fight. It is. It's, it's if you hear something, run, get out of the building, find some more to get out of the way. All right. I have some follow-up um, questions about resource officers. Um, speaking about vulnerable times in hallways, let's go to that. Um, can you tell us which schools currently have resource officers and whether there's a plan to have resource officers at every school?
Um, we have school resource officers at all the middle schools and the high schools. And um, for the elementary folks, uh, we, in the last three years, we have conducted 8,000 checks at our elementary schools. And we, we track that, that's why I know that number. Um, we started doing that after Sandy Hook. Uh, and our, this is done by our patrol officers primarily, some others do it as well, primarily by our patrol officers. They're very familiar where these elementary schools are. They're very familiar with the facilities and the surroundings and, and whatnot. And they go into those schools. Um, but that's, uh, that's where we are today. I'll add on to that, so I think I'll, I'll look to the school board first. We have 65 elementary schools. So we had, the reason I told the chief on 10 second half of the question is because the board of supervisors had a conversation at our meeting last Tuesday. Um, the chief and Ron actually made a presentation about some of these issues we're talking about tonight. And the question came up of should we fund school resource officers for every elementary school? Um, very bluntly, um, it, would be dif it would be very difficult frankly, to do that, if, particularly if we're talking about putting true school resource officers, sworn police officers um, who are in uniform in every school, um, th there's no doubt there's a very high cost to that. And I think one of the questions we would look at is, are there other safety improvements we can make um, that would be more effective than that? But the reality is this, even if there wasn't a cost, even if we could find a way to get around the cost factor, um, Hiring 65 police officers all at one time to put them in, in one in ele every elementary school would be incredibly difficult. We have a, we have, we've been adding 15, 13 new officers a year in the last few years. Um, when you add that into um, the number of people, individual police officers who retire every year, um, we have a difficult time recruiting enough of people who meet our standards uh, to work in the Princeton County Police Department each year just to meet, that, to meet that expectation. So the board has been having conversations about what, are the, what other alternatives might there be to a uniformed uh, school resource officer. Um, I think it would be a great thing to have, but again, difficult to get to. Uh, I know the Virginia state law allows um, for the school system to hire retired uh, law enforcement officials to work inside the schools. Unfortunately, Virginia's law makes it difficult to do that um, based on it's, it's complicated. Unfortunately, you get into issues of how it affects people's retirement uh, uh, pay and such like that. But we're going to be looking at, um, I was talking to the county executive just today, we're going to be looking at what new resources we can bring to bear um, for to have a higher, to even increase even further than the chief mentioned, the presence of law enforcement in our elementary schools. Um, the chief said it was 8,000 visits, is that per year? Over the last over the last year, 8,000 or so, so, so 2,500 to 3,000 visits a year. I know uh, Sheriff Hill has his deputies visit the schools when they're available to do that. So we want to have their presence there, but we want to make sure that whatever we're doing, we're putting the most effective resources in place that we can, and not just um, hiring individuals or putting new programs in place because um, it feels good at that moment. We want to make sure that we're making the right investments to maximize the security and, and getting the best results that we can um, in everything that we do. Great. Um, this should be a pretty easy question. I think I know the answer, but I got asked several times, so I will ask it. Can schools request additional police support if they feel there is a threat or a potential issue? Yes. That's what I was guessing. And we will come. All right. Um, switching back over to our mental health professionals, can we talk a little bit about um, how to talk to children about violent events at schools around the country and um, not scare them? I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm just gonna add something to the question you just asked. Sure. I actually had a number of people contact me today because they're like, why are there 10 police cars at Osborne Park today? And very simply, it was because there were threats. The police department responded. And right now, that's happening on a regular basis. So can people request to the police department? Yes, but they're doing it already on a regular basis, and the police department's responding. Um, and it's precautionary and being responsive as needed. 
Thank you. Um, okay, so going back to the next question, um, how can we talk to our children about violent events at schools around the country and not scare them? And what age is it appropriate to talk to children about possible school violence? Dr. Lucky and I were talking about this the last couple of nights um, in preparation for this panel. And that question is structured in it. The part I saw was and said not to scare them. And one of the things I thought of is that fear isn't always a bad thing. There's a functional level of fear. And that being it can um, make us more hyper aware of our surroundings, what's going on. Um, of course, there's that, there's that um, end of the spectrum where it's debilitating and we don't want to move, we don't want to go to school. And that's, that would cause issues. But a little bit of fear is not a bad thing. Um, Another thing we said is that if your child is asking you about these things, that's an appropriate time to talk with them. Um, talking with them about school shooting is going to be a family cultural decision. But if your child's asking questions to, to engage them, to, to speak to what you know, um, if, if you don't know, you reach out to your school about security. And kind of like the questions tonight about security procedures, um, drill procedures, if they don't know the answers to those questions. Um, if, if you're in a position where they think you need to talk to a therapist, to connect them there. Um, but I'm going to hand off to Dr. Lucky. Um, so let me just come back to that. Um, fear is not always a bad thing. So fear and anxiety are very easily linked together. And within sports, just to sort of remove it for a second from such a serious subject, in sports we have something called um, an anxiety performance curve. Um, and you need a certain level of anxiety to perform at your peak. Um, so there is utility in having anxiety and having fear to be motivated um, to make change, to do what you need to do. Um, so it's not always a bad thing. I don't have an age range. Um, I think it's more about maturity. And if your child is asking to be attentive and to gently guide them um, and support them in the best way possible. Yeah, and I, I think to piggyback off that is to, you know, be cognizant of, of your surroundings and what you're watching. Um, I have three boys, one of them's a ninth grader here, and he came home when everything happened with Parkland and was talking about his friends wanting to share some of those really graphic videos. You can have open conversations with your children about what's taking place and you can guide that conversation. You can have a proactive stance, but you don't have to show every single graphic detail. Um, and I remember having a conversation with him and saying, you know, those are out there. My advice is that you don't watch them at 14. You can make that decision, but, you know, I'm not sure that it would benefit you to watch them. I certainly wouldn't have shown those videos to my younger ones, but we still had an active conversation, um, you know, about what that looks like. Um, I think also it's important to talk about self-care for yourself um, because secondary trauma and vicarious trauma is very real. And so making sure that you're taking parameters to, you know, think about your actions and how you're feeling from it is, is super important when you're talking to your children as well. Um, one of the things that, that we train at OVC um, when you're becoming trauma-informed, which can be your everyday life even at home, um, is anything rhythmic and repetitive um, regulates your brainstem. And so something as simplistic as when you see a kid going like this, this is actually soothing to him. I used to be a person before I understood that where I'd slam my, my ex-husband's you know, hand down to stop him, not realizing that that was something that was really soothing. Um, it goes back to when you were in the womb, that kind of music. So when you're talking to your children about things, you can make the circumstances a little bit easier. Um, popcorn, you know, eating popcorn is rhythmic, rhythmic and repetitive. It makes things a lot easier. The lights dimming. Um, makes conversations a little bit easier to be had. Um, but I think telling the truth is super important and being able to have that conversation openly. Does anyone else have anything to add? All right. Um, Supervisor Noe, I know you've been waiting for this question all night. If the schools and the police let the county know what they need, will the county find funds for it? 
So I see the county executive sitting in the back wall of the school uh, the room. Um, so again, he's nervous about what I'm going to say, I think. But I, I, let me say this. Um, I think the question was, if, if, if the schools and the police tell us what they need, will we find funds for it? And the answer is yes. Um, the answer is yes. Um, in fact, I, I mean, we had, we had some con First of all, as I mentioned earlier, we've been uh, funding 13 new police officers a year for the last several years um, to, to make sure there were um, make sure that our police department was growing along with our population. How the chief has allocated those 13 new positions every year has changed from year to year. Um, he, you know, the chief has the unilateral authority, doesn't have to come to the board of supervisors to make the determination that he needs to put more people into category X and maybe needs a few, uh, fewer people in category Y in order to make sure that he's got personnel, he's got officers where they need to be. With the, you know, Virginia has an interesting situation as it applies to the relationship between the Board of Supervisors and the school board. Um, one of the, uh, one of the, we both, I think Willie and I have talked about this, we both get to complain about our jobs. Willie has a tremendous amount of pressure to make sure that the school system spends money on all the things the school system needs to spend money on, but he has no, he doesn't have the final decision, or Diane doesn't have the final decision about how much money the school gets. Um, on the Board of Supervisors side, the challenge we face is that we want to make sure that the school system gets the money that they need, um, but we're also at the same time balancing that out against other needs, other critical needs in the county. And, and I think what has become, I think it is what has become more important to us as a board, and I think needs to become more important to us as a community as a whole, is understanding that we shouldn't look at the services we provide to the community, be they in the form of the poli of police officers, in the form of teachers or school safety, in terms of mental health services, but also to include um, the, the interaction with our park system, for example, or our public works department, is that um, I talked a little earlier about silos and how I think we have this, we make the mistake of thinking, of asking, do we need to put money into police? Do we need to put money into schools? Do we need to put money into mental health care? And the answer is that we shouldn't look at those as co separate or competitive services. That all of, the, all of the agencies within county government, along with all of the resources that are out in the community, and perhaps most importantly, that resource beginning at the family level, are working together to make sure that um, when it comes to identifying mental health problems, that we're starting at the local level, we're starting at the family level, but that we're making sure that resources are going into our schools and are being spent wisely, that resources are going into our county agencies and are being spent wisely, but most importantly, that those agencies are talking to each other and providing those services. Uh, I, I don't think you're gonna find a single member of the Board of Supervisors who's going to uh, look negatively on providing funding for more school security this year, uh, with both within our schools and in terms of our police department. But I also think what you're gonna see more and more of from us is asking the question about how do we leverage the resources that we already have and focus them toward um, addressing the most critical needs in our community rather than having agencies sort of compete against each other with everyone trying to, you know, to hold on to their little piece of, of the budget pie. Um, bluntly, if I may, um, we are blessed, and not just in Prince William County, but in our Northern Virginia region, to be a fairly high income community. Um, we, have, we have the ability to bring you know, financial resources to bear to provide services that a lot of other communities don't. You don't have to travel very far from where we're sitting to discover a part of Virginia where there's no money for additional school security. Um, most of these communities I'm talking about don't have, uh, don't have, a, uh, don't have a, police a police chief per se, but they have an elected sheriff. Um, they don't have extra money to put into um, their sheriff's department to provide more officers on the street or perhaps more officers in the school. We do have those resources here. We're a fast-growing community and we're, we're a relatively wealthy community. And so we need to make sure that our government invests wisely, but we need to invest in the things that matter the most. And I think everyone on the Board of Supervisors would agree with that. Okay. Um, before I move on, does anyone on the panel have anything that they want to interject or anything they'd like to circle back to? Excellent then we are going to do something I said I was not going to do. I knew you were um, going to do it. So guys, we're going to take questions from the audience. And we're going to have some rules about this, because I am not an elected official. So there will be no yelling at me. 
because I will not handle it well. Um, and we are going to, again, limit the scope of this evening to local issues. You are welcome to ask about anything local that anyone on this panel can answer, but if it is a question for a congressman or a senator, they're not here and we're not going to answer it. Um, so if we can try and focus on, on what we can do in our homes, in our schools, in our community, that would be great. And I am going to hand my microphone over to Chris Noe to bring it to people with her, their hands up. So, oh, you've got one? Never mind, she's got one. So if you have questions, we will take those. Um, my name is Tom Speciale. I've got a student in, uh, that's a sophomore here in Colgan. And uh, many of you, some, if you participated in the last uh, school board meeting, you will uh, may recognize me for making an announcement that I'm offering free firearm safety training all the way up to a concealed carry permit to any member of the faculty or staff in the entire Prince William County. I know that that's not a, a, a singular solution. I don't believe that. Um, but I, I do think we have to do something, and I think it's very clear that we don't have a, uh, an easy solution. I wanna, I wanna point something out I think everybody should notice, that the most substantive part of this conversation has been from the mental health professionals on that board, and I appreciate it, because it's quite clear that this problem is a mental health problem. We should be having a mental health legislation conversation instead of a gun control conversation. If we have, a mental health conversation. We can do a lot for suicide prevention. We can do a lot for the bullying problem. And instead of hiring 65 resource officers, my suggestion would be hire 65 mental health professionals and social workers. That'll be money way better spent. Did you have a question, sir? So my question, my question is this. Um, at the school board meeting, it was brought up that there was a conversation to fund an armored car service to pick up the money from the high schools. At the school board meeting, that is a conversation that's taking place about funding a service to pick up our money from our high school. And when the point was brought up to instead possibly look at putting security issues in front of something like that, there was a lot of pushback on the board by several members of the board, most of the board, to do that. So I guess my question is to the law enforcement professionals, uh, which one do you think is more important? Hiring resource professionals or resource officers? Or do you think that we should prioritize resourcing 65 additional mental health professionals? Which one do you think you're going to get the bigger bang for your buck out of? And I guess my second question is, what's more important? mental health professionals, or an armored car service. I don't know too much about this armored car question. I learned a little bit about it this afternoon, but not, uh, I'd have to learn more about what that's all about, really, to comment on that. Um, I think you have to have a balance. I think they're both important in their own in their own way, as I said earlier. Uh, you have to have, I think, the right complement. You know, do you need X number of officers in schools, things of that nature? Uh, it's all, it's all has to be balanced and complemented in the correct manner. Uh, and I think we all in law enforcement, and the sheriff may want to comment on this too, you know, we all in law enforcement support mental health services. Uh, there needs to be more counseling services, more mental health services. Um, but we also want to do the right thing in terms of uh, uh, law enforcement services as well. So I don't know that it's a, it's a uh, either or kind of thing, uh, but you do have to balance it correctly. And what we need to do in Prince William County, which is what we've been doing in terms of the law enforcement, is have a predictable and sustained staffing plan where we, the police department, can uh, know what resources we're going to be getting and then deploy them in the manner that we think provides the best value and uh, to our community and that's what we try to do but we also you know I've, I've, I've kind of a different topic but 
Uh, you know, an opioid addiction is one, would be one example. I've been in a number of venues with the board and others where, you know, do you need more officers to do this or that to help combat anything or do something? Well, we really don't, not for that purpose, you know. Um, every police chief and, and, and probably sheriff, you know, tongue-in-cheek, you know, how many officers do you have? Tongue-in-cheek answer is not enough kind of thing. But and for the opioid, you know, we're, we're having 40 to 50 people overdose every year and resulting in death in Prince William County the last couple of years. So we need counselors, counseling services, you know, and, and, and it's the same thing here. We do need counseling services. We do need those, those services available to a wide range of people. But we also need the proper complement of uh, other resources such as law enforcement. Uh, we need to look at the physical uh, facilities, which, which we talked a little bit about tonight. We need technology. Uh, we need intelligence, and we talked a little bit about that too. So, Sheriff, sure. yeah. uh, Chief, I agree with you. I don't think that law enforcement and mental health services should compete with each other because they're both needed um, to keep our kids and our community safe. Um, I'm also the chairman of the jail board, and mental health is a big issue in jails because when people are incarcerated, it's important that we provide those services to those folks so that when they return to our community, hopefully they'll be a lot better than when they were incarcerated. So yes, uh, law enforcement needs and mental health needs, they do compete with each other, but they're both needed uh, to keep our community safe. And, and I think moving forward, um, let's try and keep the questions to, you know, not on gun control and not debating those two issues about what's more important because there's a lot of people here that have substantial questions. And I think to make Christina's life a lot easier, um, we should stay focused on the topics that are at hand here. I appreciate that. We're going to invite you up to the microphone. If, if you are unable to get to the microphone, please just throw a hand up and we'll get to you. And Mrs. Ralston, did you have a comment on a... The last. Mr. Can I go now? One of the things that we have a we have difficulty with here in Prince William is that we have no mental health beds. Once upon a time, earlier in the twentieth century, we had at least four at the hospital. Now we have zero. So no matter what these two gentlemen do, there's no bed to put them in, so you put them inside you know, of the jail and then hope that people like the ones of my partners down here on the end, that they will show up and talk about, the, help to talk about the feelings and what this person is up against. But we have no beds in our hospital. And that's a problem. Uh, to add to that, I know on any given occasion, I know this past weekend, uh, we went as far as Virginia Beach to take a patient to a hospital. And I know the police department, uh, we work together in partners in transporting uh, per persons in need of, of mental health assistance all over the state because we do not have beds in our community. Our next question. Hi, I'm hoping this is an easy one for you guys, but uh, in terms of safety, the elementary school that my ch children go to, there's no cell phone reception uh, for the teachers or for the parents who are volunteering, and that to me poses a safety issue. Um, you know, when you're talking about what happened in Florida and the kids were able to text their families and, and talk to their families um, as they were in this scenario and let them know that they were okay. Um, or if the teachers needed to be able to, to get messages out immediately. Uh, the, the schools, I guess, are made of concrete, <laughs> cinder blocks, um, but I know that it could be an easy solution, but is there money to be able to put these repeating towers in the schools to be able to get the, the teachers and the administrators the cell phone access they need to be able to have that in the school? So, you know, we were, we've been had a little conversation in the air um, about, and you used a phrase that I really appreciate you using. You used the phrase, no easy solution. Because with none of this, is there an easy solution? And you asked about something that feels easy, right? How, how do we get better self-tone coverage? 
Um, now, there's a, I'm gonna share like a good and a bad. Um, I, I don't know, I, I don't wanna put you on the spot. I'm not sure what the situation that ex at that particular school is. What I do know is that I think particularly some of our older schools, you could have a cell tower right outside the school, and you're not gonna get very good reception because you've got four feet of concrete that make the outside wall. But in my day job, I work in a building that I have to go out to the parking lot to make a cell phone call. Um, so that's a challenge. Yeah, I'll be honest, I haven't, I don't, I'll look at the school members, I don't know that we've had, we haven't gotten any, at the elective level, any requests for funding for cell phone repeaters. I know there's technology that allows, like essentially, you, you create a little cell tower inside a building that plugs into the internet. And I don't, I don't know that we've had any sort of budget discussions about that, but it might be something that I'd let the professionals look at to see, you know, sort of if it's, a, if it's, a, if it's the right priority. Um, there's a, not directly related, but there's an interesting new change that's taken place too. And uh, if the General Assembly just re um, adjourned for the year on Saturday, and frankly, to the over the objections of most local governments, state law is about to change to make it easier for cell tower companies to install facilities without the Board of Supervisors having to give them permission to do so. So in some cases, you may have places where there's not a cell tower nearby, and there may be a reason that the local zoning ordinance didn't allow it or there were community objections. Um, for better or for worse, maybe having nothing to do with school safety, I think you're gonna see with this new law more cell towers popping up. Um, but I think, I think something I'd, uh, uh, I, I would look into, I mean, I think we should look into this question of do we need to improve cell connectivity um, for any number of reasons actually in these schools. Agreed, functionality for the teachers to be able to do their lessons and having access to internet. So. Mrs. Ralston, did you have something to add? Yeah. And Sadan? Yes. Um, we have, we're putting it um, bandwidth, and that doesn't have a whole lot to do with your cell phone problem. Uh, Bevel Middle School has the same problem that you're talking about. And so, you know, part of the problem is that the people that live around the schools use uh, the signal in our schools. Now, I don't know what we do about that. <laughs> I don't think very much of anything, probably. So, but as we move this along, I, as I said to you, um, uh, we will put your school in there and see what happens. Okay. Thank you. Next question. My name is, Ter My name is Terazia St. Clair, and I have a law enforcement support organization in our community here. And I have one question about bullying. What we found in our analysis is that one in four students are bullied, and that becomes a root issue as to when we see bad actors do bad things. And so I'd like to hear from the panel what we're doing about bullying. I know it's a fundamental program we've talked about for years in the school system, but what are we doing to kind of link that with these bad actors who we've seen a pattern of behavior over years throughout the school system? How are we dealing with that? And then I have a secondary question after that. Anyone want to tackle bullying? Yeah, that's not really my alley, but I'll tell you, you know, we do have um, numbers of schools that we give them tools. Uh, one of those tools is called the Olvaeus uh, system, which has been implemented in a number of schools in the school division. Um, that comes under our student services department. They deal with uh, training of staff and, and counseling and bullying, and it's handled with, uh, you know, on the disciplinary process also. So. Can't get real in depth on it because I don't work with that every day, but there are some resources uh, in the school division is very aware of it as man, you know, working on that. If I could just add an antidote to what you said, and thank you for your response. Uh, what we've learned as well through our analysis and school surveys around the country is that students who look different, students who have a different nationality or race, and those that are of the LBGT community are most bullied. And so I just want to throw that out as something for the school board and law enforcement officials to think about. They become root issues that grow. And so I just ask you to think about it, not a question, just a statement. Thank you. And then my secondary comment is that um, we are an organization that focuses on technology and how to leverage technology to improve our school systems and some of our institutions. I'd love an audience to talk about that with certainly Chief Yu and uh, the right folks here, but we have great technologies available to help in these situations, and I just ask that I have an ear and maybe some time to talk about that in the future. I'm gonna jump in really quickly. On the back of this handy-dandy little thing that you got, there is contact information for all of your elected officials, and you can bug them all you want. They love it. <laughs> 
Good evening. First, thank you, Supervisor Noe and everyone else for putting this on. This is really important. Um, I was originally going to ask about the overcrowding issue and, and the trailers, because that's come up, and I actually had a conversation with a, a member of the police department, and he expressed concern because in some cases with the schools, you have students who are in these trailers, the SRO, whoever's on duty might be inside, and they can't necessarily hear what's going on where the trailers are, so that's a concern. I also want to talk about overcrowding in general because you folks talked about looking at the kids, making sure that the teachers are aware of what's going on with the kids, but if we have so many students in these classes, how are these teachers supposed to really look at it? But my actual question is, um, I was actually alerted to the fact that uh, a certain supervisor is on his Facebook page talking about Prince William County being the first Virginia County to hire trained retired police officers to protect our kids in school. I don't know whose purview this actually is. I'm not sure if that's a school board decision or a supervisor's decision, but it's kind of strange to me that the supervisor would proclaim this. Um, is there so a question? My question is, is that actually going to happen or not? Okay, thank you. That seemed to be a directed question, but anyone can answer it if they'd like to. I mean, I think we're looking at numbers of things. Um, I don't know, you know, that I'm really prepared to, to discuss that in full right now, but um, there are laws in place for those things to happen, and I think with all the things going on in school security, there's a lot of conversations happening at this level to see what the best use of funds is uh, to manage uh, the security problems that we have or security issues that we have. So just to clarify as a follow-up, if that were to be something that would be decided, would that be decided by the school board? So let me let me jump on this. Um, that wasn't, I'm, I'm not the supervisor. No, you're not. Facebook no, page. no, you're not. I mostly have stuff about my love of bacon and, right. and uh, pictures of my kids no. on my Facebook. Um, but um, so I, I, I touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, we could, if, we're, if we want to put, you know, if we want to put resources into having law enforcement in the schools, that might be a more cost-effective way to do it. I'll share a little bit of the, the legal complications with it. There is a legitimate challenge, and it's a very odd thing. The, the, the state assembly um, passed a law saying that school systems, specifically school systems, can hire retired law enforcement officials to, to work uh, providing, they're not security guards, they would be you know, a, a notch of, sort of between security guard and school resource officer. It's legal to do so, um, but the Virginia retirement system has rules about people who are getting their pension coming back and becoming government employees again. That feels like an incredibly simple thing to fix, and it's not. Um, there may be a way around it, but we, we couldn't hire them as full-time employees, for example. I don't say that to say that it should or shouldn't happen, but what I would say is, um, I'll, I, I will, I'll let my school board friends off the hook here. They don't have money in their budget for in their proposed budget for next year to hire off-duty, or excuse me, retired police officers in the schools. I think if it was going to happen, you'd have to have additional funding coming from the board of supervisors. We would have to approve that. For, for, I'm, I'm one supervisor. I don't speak for the entire board on this. It's an idea that I'm open to if we have a clear understanding from the professionals, from folks like Mr. Crow. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Chief Bernard, Sheriff Hill, telling me that this is the right way to invest those funds. Um, I think we, you know, one of the, I think one of the things that makes this topic difficult is we, the people in this room, we can come up with a hundred million dollars worth of ideas on how to make schools safer, and we still wouldn't have prevented every possible risk scenario from, from potentially happening. So we have to target funds at that which makes the biggest difference. Because it hasn't happened yet in Virginia, we don't have a lot of data as to whether or not it's, it's the right place to invest. I think if we were to proceed down that path of hiring uh, retired law enforcement for our schools, for our elementary schools in particular, I think the way to do it would be through a pilot program, um, you know, to, to figure out, pick a number. It, can you start with 10 or six or whatever the right number is um, and get that training? Um, you know, there is, and it's not just as simple as any retired police officer. You have to establish policies, you have to establish standards. There's a new route of training that has to take place. It would be, even if we had the money, it would, like I said earlier, we, if, if be at SROs or retirees, it would be difficult to hire that many people all at once. But I think it's something that we could, we could do in a pilot program if, in fact, these folks up here, whose job it is to make those policy recommendations to us, think it's the right way to do it. 
Flip side is, if I'm hearing from the school division, if I'm hearing from my chief, if I'm hearing from my sheriff, that there's something that's a more urgent investment, well then that's why I want to put the money. Does that, does that help? It does. Okay. Thank you.